Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, it is lovely to have you all on board again this evening. Um, we seem to be doing this quite a lot at the moment, which is rather nice. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us this evening um, for our talk about the Falklands and South Georgia with Dan. Um, Dan, when was it you went? I think you went in October last year, wasn't it? It was indeed, yeah, October last year. October last year. Um, and I think I'm right in saying it was the first time you've been to South Georgia, but you had been to the Falklands, right? Yes, absolutely. Yep, correct. Good o. That's two out of two. Excellent. I'll see if I can find another question. <laughs> it's probably best to stop there, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quick whilst you're ahead. Um, so look, uh, it's wonderful to have everybody on board this evening. Uh, Dan's going to be talking, as the slide suggests, about the Falklands in South Georgia. Um, uh, I've been to the Falklands two or three times, most recently in November of last year, um, when I was on a trip to the Falklands in South Georgia. Um, and the Falklands totally and utterly blew me away. I was amazed. Um, I had previously been some years before, quite a few years before, 10 or 15 years previously. And um, oh, so I was so impressed this time. I thought the wildlife in the Falklands was just magnificent. And South Georgia I've been to once before, and it was even more amazing on this last occasion than when I went before. So I'm very excited to see your talk, Dan. Absolutely no pressure, obviously. <laughs> Thanks for that, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen so many images. Yeah. Um, and look, if anybody would like to ask Dan any questions um, during the course of his presentation, or at least questions that I can pose to Dan at the end of the presentation, please do make use of the Q&A, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and also the chat facility. You're very welcome to uh, pose any questions that you like, and um, we will do our level best to answer them between the two of us, but mostly Dan. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, hey, Dan, I'm going to leave you to it. Uh, I'll Lovely. Be here. Um, if there are any disasters, I'll tell you. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Chris. I'll speak to you in a bit. Yeah. Um, yes, as Chris suggested, um, I was lucky enough to visit South Georgia and the Falklands um, in October last year, and it was, in my opinion, probably the best wildlife trip I've ever been on. And in the next 45, 50 minutes, something like that, I'm just going to run through a series of slides, um, some photos, a little bit of video as well, um, all from that trip, all taken either by myself or, or by my wife, who's a, a very keen photographer, and hopefully show you um, why I rated it such a high, well, rated it so highly, you know, in terms of um, wildlife experiences, it was absolutely in incredible. Um, it was a 14 night voyage around the Falklands and South Georgia. And uh, yeah, sit back and, and see what you think, really. Um, before we get started and get into the, into the wildlife, I think it's quite helpful just to consider the logistics of getting out to um, the Falklands and South Georgia. It's not an easy place to get to. Um, you don't just think, oh, I want to visit the Falklands and South Georgia and jump on a flight um, and go straight out there. It needs a bit of thought. Um, and there's two options, really. You can either fly from RAF Bryce Norton, which is in Oxfordshire, uh, via Cape Verde down to the Falklands. And that's on a military aircraft. Um, it's with the squaddies, with the, the Falklands civilians. Um, and that works perfectly fine. Um, but it does have some small issues in the sense that there's only limited availability there and it is very expensive uh, for that flight as well and it is subject to change at the last minute. I flew um, on that flight a few years ago when I went to the Falklands and it was it was fine. Um, the service on the flight was was pretty simple but, but did the job. Um, the alternative is to fly now directly from London to Santiago in Chile and you can spend a night there and then fly down to Punta Arenas the following morning and then on to the Falklands. And that's a that route from Santiago down to Punta Arenas on, on to the Falklands is, is once a week, every Saturday. Now, we had a night in Santiago. We'd arrived around 11 o'clock in the morning and had the afternoon uh, just to relax at the hotel. Uh, and we stayed at the Singular Hotel, which is what we're going to be using for our Festival of Wildlife in 2025. Um, I should add, 
that this trip was all about um, wrecking the, the festival for 2025. Um, and much of the detail that you'll see today relates to that trip. Um, and yes, as I said, this is the hotel that we're going to be using uh, in Santiago. It's got a nice rooftop terrace. Uh, it's a great place to grab a drink and, and a bite to eat. Then the following morning, uh, it was an early start and uh, it's a three hour flight down to Punta Arenas over some spectacular scenery. You're flying over the Andes, uh, which are absolutely amazing. Um, and you have to jump off in Punta Arenas, um, go through immigration and then jump back on the plane and fly onto the Falklands, which is about an hour and a half. Now, landing in the Falklands, um, Mount Pleasant Airport is, is a military airport. Um, it seems to be manned by only a handful of people. So it can take a little while just to process through customs and immigration there. Um, but once you're through, uh, you've got your bags, you jump on a coach and it's about an hour long drive to get to Stanley. And just driving through the interior of the Falklands, uh, you get to see some of the island's wildlife uh, and specifically some of the bird life as you're driving along. Um, the habitat is not dissimilar to what you might expect in Scotland, for example, the Scottish Highlands, but the flora and the fauna is very different. Um, this is a, a long-tailed meadowlark, uh, one of my favourites from the Falklands. This is a Falklands thrush. Uh, this is an upland goose and also a turkey vulture. And these were all seen um, just on the way to Stanley. Now, arriving in Stanley, we had about an hour uh, just to take a wander around. Now, Stanley is, is quite a quaint little town. Uh, there's nothing too much to it, really. Uh, there's a couple of gift shops. So there's the church at the back there, uh, and there is also a museum. So it is it is certainly worth a visit. Um, historically, obviously, it's very interesting. Uh, it's got this massive sign. Uh, it's compulsory to have your photo taken with this sign, uh, as Danny is here. And um, no, it, it's a nice start to the trip. But in essence, you're in Stanley to board the vessel. Um, and our vessel for this trip uh, was the Magellan Explorer. And she was anchored a couple hundred meters offshore. And this is the same vessel that we're gonna be using for the festival uh, in 2025. And in my opinion, she's one of the finest vessels out there for this type of trip. Uh, she's purpose built for expeditions to the Antarctic. Uh, she's got image stabilizers. And she's also got um, a, a very healthy number of cabins in the terms of it's not too many. There's, there's about a capacity for about 90 people on board, which is a great number to be traveling with. Um, the communal areas on board are, are very smart. Uh, this is the bar area. There's a lecture kind of theater area just to the left here. Um, there's also a library, there's a gym. Uh, there's also a sauna, if, if you're that way tempted. Um, and the restaurant on board is, is superb. Um, you've typically got um, breakfast and lunch served as a buffet. And then in the evening, uh, there's the a la carte menu. And it's a uh, complimentary wine, which is very good. Um, what I particularly like about the restaurant, uh, not only is the food superb, but it's set up either for couples, for fours, for sixes or for eights. So depending on how sociable you're feeling, uh, you can either have a, a table just for yourself or indeed you can catch up with some friends on board with 14 nights on board, um, you know, there's plenty of opportunity to do both. Um, on our first evening on the vessel, um, we were just super excited, Danny and I. Uh, we wanted to grab a, a window seat and sat there just scanning for wildlife and, and taking the scenery. Um, this was all after having boarded the vessel, um, had a safety briefing, uh, been shown around uh, to our cabins and so forth and familiarized ourselves with the layout of the vessel. And that evening, um, setting sail from Stanley about five o'clock in the afternoon, we've repositioned uh, around the top of the Falklands. Uh, before I get to that, um, just a very quick photo of the cabins. They're all very comfortable. They're all en suite. Um, there's a small number of porthole cabins. There's um, deluxe verandas, uh, verandas, and then also suites. And this, what you see here is a deluxe veranda. And as the name suggests, it has got uh, a balcony here, which we spent quite a bit of time on just scanning the oceans for wildlife. Now leaving Stanley and traveling around the north uh, coast of the Falklands, we headed west initially um, to Saunders Island where we woke up the following morning just to find ourselves anchored a couple hundred meters offshore. Now this isn't the most exciting video you're gonna to see tonight, uh, well hopefully not anyway, but this is just a, a short clip of us um, boarding one of the Zodiacs which is used to take us ashore. Um, we quite often get a lot of questions around how agile you need to be to get in and out of the Zodiacs. So this gives you a good idea of what you can expect from the experience. The crew on board, I have to add, are, are really well drilled in getting you onto the Zodiacs and off the Zodiacs. From here, you would travel um, 
uh, ashore in the Zodiac and there'd be a team waiting to meet you um, on the beach who would um, take hold of the Zodiac and help you get out and, and get you ashore. Now that first morning um, arriving on Saunders Island, it was absolutely breathtaking. Um, the sunrise was just magical and there was a colony of Gen 2 penguins up on the ridge line. And it was one of four penguin species that we saw that morning. Uh, the Gen 2s were gradually making their way down to the, uh, to the shoreline. Uh, penguins on land, they're not particularly fast, so you've got plenty of time to get in position to, to photograph them. And in this morning light, it was really wonderful. Uh, this is the guys just taking to the water, just a few shots that Danny was able to get on that morning. Now, one of the nice things about Gen 2s is when they come back ashore, they tend to come back ashore uh, in small flocks and they throw themselves up the beach. So it's one of the species which you'll see um, quite classic photos of where you've got a whole flock of penguins emerging from the surf at once. They're also one of the most charismatic um, penguin species. They're very inquisitive and will quite often just come up to you. Another species we saw on this first morning in Saunders was a king penguin, um, an absolutely stunning looking penguin. And it stands nearly a meter high. Um, it's the second biggest penguin in the world after the emperor penguin. And there's a small colony on Saunders, um, a mixture of adults and last year's chicks. Now, what was bizarre for me was you had this perfect kind of white sand, turquoise sea. It was like something out of the tropics, like something out of the Caribbean. And yet you had penguins all around you. Um, and just in this light, it was just fabulous. There's opportunities to mess around with different images and stuff. Now, the whole time we were on Saunders, we were told, look, you know, don't get too wrapped up in the king penguins. You're going to be seeing a few of these later. And so that proves. But nevertheless, you can't help but get excited when you see your first kings. Uh, and here's just a little bit of footage that I took. These are obviously the adults uh, in the full plumage, and then you've got the chicks uh, in, in their furry kind of brown down. Now, further inland, uh, there was quite a few Magellanic penguins. Um, these are also known as the jackass penguins locally, just on account of the call that they make, which sounds a lot like a donkey, uh, in all honesty. Uh, these guys are fiercely territorial and they'll have arrived back um, in the Falklands around September time. And at this point, they were guarding their burrows. Um, they tend to lay their eggs around mid-October time. Uh, so they would paired up and uh, were occupying the burrows, but one of the birds was always stood near the entrance. Now, a little further up the hillside, uh, on Saunders that was a black-browed albatross colony. It was a couple hundred birds, uh, but it was very cool to see, especially against this lovely backdrop of this turquoise sea. Um, the birds have just arrived back uh, and were pairing back up with their mates. They mate for life um, and finding nest sites. So it was really quite wonderful just being able to see these birds just at close quarters. Um, they're impressive, you know, impressive specimens. They measure two and a half meter wingspan and um, just being able to see them like this was, was fabulous. Again, just photographing them against that turquoise sea was absolutely superb. Now in amongst the black browed albatrosses, there was also a small number of rock copper penguins. Uh, these are the smallest penguins in the Falklands, uh, and they're also the most agile. As their name suggests, they're able to hop up the rocks. And it's incredible to see the cliff faces that they can work their way up. Uh, they get themselves into some really quite difficult positions. Um, they've got that fabulous yellow kind of eye stripe and plume, and just here it's, it's backlit. It was really uh, quite a a special species to see for me. It was one which was, um, you know, high on my list. Now, while we were on that hillside there, just looking down, managed to spot a small pod of Commerson's dolphins. Uh, and these again are just very, very pretty uh, little dolphins, uh, black and white markings. And when they came together, as you're seeing now, uh, just riding that wave, it was absolutely magical. A few other characters that we were introduced to on this first morning on Saunders. Um, these are snowy sheath bills. Um, these were actually to be a feature through the trip. We were to see these later on in South Georgia, uh, but seeing them for the first time uh, just on the shores of Saunders was, was quite special. Um, they're a bizarre species. Um, I'm told that they're distantly related to waders, but you wouldn't really think it to look at them. Uh, they're good swimmers and they will eat 
pretty much anything that they can get their bills on. Uh, they're prolific scavengers, so they will eat anything from from feces, from uh, regurgitated krill. Uh, they'll peck at carcasses. Um, pretty much, you name it, they'll eat it. Um, Danny and I nicknamed them meat pigeons uh, just because they have a, a pigeon-like appearance. Another species we saw that morning was the Falklands steamer duck. This is a flightless endemic to the Falklands, um, fiercely territorial, uh, on account of the fact that they can't fly. Uh, if they're threatened, they try and run across the water whilst flapping their wings. And that sound uh, can sound a little bit like an old paddle steamer, which is how, how they get their name, uh, steamer duck. We also saw a uh, dolphin gull, uh, which as gulls go, I mean, this must be one of the most beautiful gulls in the world. Uh, just absolutely splendid uh, plumage there. And also oyster catchers. This is a Magellanic oyster catcher, but you've also got blackish oyster catcher out there. So two oyster catchers uh, that are possible in the Falklands. Now, after the morning on Saunders, uh, we returned back to the vessel. And it's important to add that whilst they set like a, a first um, time for arrival on Saunders and, and a final time for, um, for, for departure. You can in fact leave whenever you want through the day um, and the, the guys will taxi you back to the vessel, even if that's just to knit back to the vessel to use the facilities to maybe grab some breakfast and come back again. There's always that option. So that's really quite nice to have up your sleeve. Um, and on returning to the vessel, it's always important that you wash um, your boots, your waterproofs, anything that may have come into contact with any organic material uh, on the islands. It's so important to maintain uh, biosecurity uh, across the different destinations. So this will become a, a daily feature, a daily routine for you um, on the trip. Now, after the morning on Saunders, uh, we repositioned over lunch to West Point, which we can see here uh, just to the west of Saunders. And it's the one of the westernmost islands on the Falklands. And it's really best known for its uh, fabulous colony of black browed albatrosses. Uh, it's about a two kilometer walk to get to the colony and it's positioned right on the west western side of West Point. Um, but this colony is far bigger than what we saw earlier on Saunders and offered some fantastic photographic opportunities in the late afternoon light and into the early evening. Uh, the birds were all taking up their nest sites and also just kind of reaffirming bonds. Uh, as I said before, they, they mate for life. So a lot of these birds will have been at sea for most of the winter and are now coming ashore to breed and to find their partners and uh, to raise a chick. Just watching them interact with each other was really quite magical. Now, there's no shortage of opportunity to capture photos of the birds in flight or just to observe them shooting past. Um, these are impressive birds, you know, two and a half meter wingspan. Um, and just as I say, being able to see them at such close quarters was very special. Uh, and we spent several hours just watching uh, the birds coming into the colony um, and just adjusting as, as the light adjusted as well. Uh, as you started to lose the light, it just became beautiful orange out over the water. Uh, which we'll see in a moment. There we are. This was one of the final shots uh, of the afternoon before we retreated back to the vessel uh, where we had dinner, got a good night's sleep and then woke up the following morning to find that we were anchored off Steeple Jason, uh, which is one of the uh, most outlying islands in the Falklands. And this place uh, is really quite spectacular. It doesn't receive too many visitors uh, on account of the fact that it is quite remote. Uh, it's quite exposed, so it's not easy to land here. We were very fortunate in the sense that the seas were relatively calm and we were able to get ashore. And the reason for getting ashore was to get to this place. It was a black-browed albatross colony uh, of over 100,000 birds. Um, it was, it was mind-boggling, really, to see them in such numbers in amongst the tussock ground, grass and then further down by the shoreline. Again, some wonderful photographic opportunities and it's just, uh, it was absolutely superb kind of just soaking in the whole atmosphere 
the sights, the smells, the noises uh, with that many birds is really quite a, a loud sound and, and, you know, of calls and, and interaction that the birds are, are, you know, they're constantly bickering with each other and interacting with each other as well, and pushing each other off nest sites and so forth. But they are absolutely fabulous. Another species we encountered here was the striated caracara. Now this bird unfortunately has been really uh, badly persecuted across much of the Falklands. Um, it's known as the, the Johnny Rook um, and there's various tales of them predating lambs and stuff and whatever else, which is absolute rubbish really in all honesty, but nevertheless they were very badly persecuted. And so you don't tend to see too many striated caracaras across uh, the Falkland Islands where there's any farm settlements, but out on Steeple Jason, um, where there isn't any farming, um, these birds are, are really quite tame, as we can see here. Um, they're incredibly inquisitive. Um, and this one just came and landed on my knee. And you'll see that there's one behind, just over the back of my shoulder there that just kept pulling at my hat as well. But that was quite a cool experience to, to be up close with those birds. They are, as I stated, incredibly curious, um, and they were later seen hovering around this colony of sea lions. Um, they have a, a bit of a nasty habit of waiting for the sea lions to defecate, and then they jump on that and eat that, which on seeing it after they'd been on me, I kind of had second thoughts about whether that was a good idea or not, but hey-ho, I'm still here to tell the tale. But seeing these sea lions was also very impressive. We kept our distance from them because they can be a little bit touchy. Now, after the morning on Steeple Jason, uh, back on board, and it was now time to reposition ourselves over to South Georgia, a distance of around 950 miles. And this was to take the remainder of that afternoon, two full days and the following morning to get to South Georgia. And over the course of that time, you really settle into kind of expedition life, into vessel life. Uh, you've obviously got your meals through the day, breakfast, lunch and dinner. And then the expedition team on board lay on a series of talks. Um, these guys are from various backgrounds. Some are uh, ornithologists, you've got geologists, you've got historians, you've got marine biologists. So quite a range of uh, different areas. And a, a series of talks were presented across the course of the day um, and, and those days when we were on board. It's an opportunity to get your sea legs and stuff as well. Um, and get a feeling for being out on the water and also just to do some some photography and some scanning from from deck um we spent a lot of time out on deck just looking either for cetaceans or even for seabirds and there was a fabulous array of pelagic species that accompanied us um cape petrels these were seen almost daily in small flocks just flying alongside the vessel uh, this is a, a southern giant petrel and we know this is southern giant petrel just because it's got that yellowy green tip to its bill uh, but it's very similar to a northern giant petrel but here we can see that there's a red tip to the bill so that's how you distinguish between the two but these are big birds these are just a little bit smaller than a black browed albatross but a bit more heavier set so they've got that big head and that big bill so they're really quite distinctive here we have a southern former in amongst the cape petrel uh, flock and um, these are just a few of the pelagic species that were seen uh, as we crossed across to south georgia this is an antarctic prion um, they're very small little birds a bit like the size of a little tern that, that kind of size and these were again seen in small flocks just from the vessel now we also i'm pleased to say saw quite an interesting range of albatrosses as you might expect the black browed albatrosses that were seen on the falklands um, going in very good numbers, particularly as we left the Falklands, uh, but we also encountered some other fabulous species. And what we have here is a light mantled albatross. Uh, it's an absolute beaut of a bird, in my opinion, um, one of my favourites from the trip. Um, it's very similar to a sooty albatross, which has the same kind of dark coloured wings, uh, but also has a dark uh, mantle and, and body to it. So it's a uniform dark colour, whereas with the light mantle, it's a little bit lighter. These guys have a wingspan of around 2.2 metres, so a little bit smaller than the black brown albatross, but absolutely fabulous to see. Now, this has to be my favourite albatross that was seen on that crossing. Um, it's a grey headed albatross. And when you see the grey contrasting with the yellow of the bill and the white underbelly, uh, it's just such a striking bird, absolutely fabulous. Again, around 2.2 meters in uh, with wingspan. Now this bird is one of the great albatrosses. And what we're looking at here is a Southern Royal albatross. 
It's very similar to the wandering albatross, which was also seen, but we weren't able to get a photo of it. Um, but these guys are taking the size up to a whole nother level. Uh, their wingspans are over three and a half meters. Um, it's absolutely staggering to see them in the flesh. Um, you see them kind of way back coming towards the, the vessel and it's like seeing a glider come in. Um, I was so excited to see both the Southern Royal and the Wandering Albatross, not least because the Wandering Albatross is allegedly the, the largest flying bird in the world. Uh, it's something that I'd read about as a kid and to see one for real was, was really very special. Um, they are almost identical. The, the key distinguishing feature between the two is that the Wandering Albatross has a little uh, peachy colored marking on its cheek. Um, so if you're able to see that closely, that was how you, distin you, know, you distinguish between the two. Now, after two and a half days, three days at sea, um, at one, one o'clock uh, on the third day of traveling, um, one o'clock in the afternoon, we sighted land. And by three o'clock, we were moored up in Wright Whale Bay, uh, which is just on the northern coast of South Georgia, just at the western end. And this is what greeted us. Um, it was a magnificent sight. Uh, literally thousands of king penguins, um, both adults and youngsters, um, all in this bay with this magnificent backdrop of mountains. And there was also uh, quite a large colony, several hundred elephant seals, which we hadn't seen in the Falklands. And these animals were just incredible. At this time in the afternoon, uh, a lot of the king penguins were returning from a day's fishing. Um, so they were coming ashore in small flocks of 10, 15, 20 birds. And again, they're not particularly fast moving. So there's plenty of opportunity to get into position to photograph them side on or head on. There's just another photo from that first afternoon on Right Whale Bay. Now at the back of Right Whale Bay, uh, there was a big snowy plain, um, just untouched pristine snow. And there was just a small colony of king penguins set in amongst it. Uh, it was really quite spectacular, just the contrast in the, the color, the yellow, the orange of the, of the um, plumage of the king penguins in amongst the snowy landscape. And this one king penguin just strayed away from the colony. Uh, it's just such a stark kind of bleak environment. Uh, it's just fantastic um, to see them in such a, a spectacular landscape. Now, as I said, in the late afternoon, they were arriving uh, back from a day's fishing. They can roam up to 100 kilometers in a day in search of either squid, um, in search of lanternfish, or even um, krill. Krill is a, an important part of their diet. And krill uh, is a small crustacean, about five, six centimeters in length, a bit shrimp-like, but it occurs in huge numbers around the coasts of South Georgia. And that's what's able to sustain uh, this incredible diversity and, and quantity of uh, marine life that we find here. Now we were watching the penguins coming ashore, um, as you do, hopefully you can all see this okay. What I ask you to do is just to keep an eye to the left of the penguins as they come in, particularly as they beach. Just in case you missed it, I've got a replay for you. So we had no idea that this leopard seal was waiting in the shadows here for these king penguins to come in. Um, fortunately, these king penguins evaded the leopard seal, uh, but he didn't half give us a surprise when he merged out from the water just as they beached but the next wave of penguins weren't so fortunate and it did actually manage to catch one of those and leopard seals they, they don't have the appendages to, to hold the pink king penguins or, or any penguins for that matter so they really just have to thrash them around to break them up into small pieces which can be consumed um i did get some footage but on consulting my colleagues, they all felt that it was a bit too graphic. So I'm not going to show you that, but um, it was something, uh, it was really quite 
special to, to witness. Um, I'd been desperate to see leopard seals. Um, it was probably top of the, my wish list in terms of the, the species that I wanted to see on this trip. And uh, we were lucky enough to see them at every landing. Uh, they're usually associated with the, uh, the pack ice down in Antarctica, but a small number come up to South Georgia uh, over the winter months and some hang around all summer, usually around the penguin colonies. Now they've obviously got a bit of a reputation for being penguin killers, um, but in fact, they actually feed on krill a lot of the time. About 50% of their diet is the krill and their teeth are designed to be able to filter the krill out from the water. They can measure up to three meters in length and the females are much larger than the males. So they really are quite incredible looking mammals. Um, around humans, there's not too many cases of them being aggressive towards humans. They're more curious, um, but they, they don't really show any fear. And uh, as I said, we saw them quite frequently over the course of the next five days. Now, whilst the leopard seals are big, you know, three meters, that, that's not insignificant. Um, elephant seals take it to a whole nother level. Um, and there's over 400,000 elephant seals in South Georgia, and they are absolutely enormous. Um, the males, they can measure over five meters in length and weigh over four tons. And at this time of the year, um, the males uh, will have collected together harems of females, uh, which they guard, um, ferociously against any encroaching males and harems can measure what well, excuse me and can have as many as 60 to 70 uh, females present um, the males will come ashore ahead of the females so they come ashore in September and then in October the females arrive and they give birth to young now these young uh, are born uh, pretty helpless really uh, they weigh about 40 kgs um, at birth and you're usually alerted to uh, a birth um, by the presence of these skewers uh, the giant petrels, they tend to come in as well. They all try and feed on the afterbirth. And over the course of the next four or five days, we saw multiple births, um, you know, sometimes four or five births a day. Um, but the females then suckle the pups uh, for up to about 25 days. And over those 25 days, they grow in weight from an average of 40 kgs up to over 180 kgs. That's incredible. That's over five kilos a day um, just on the mother's milk. And over this time, the mothers, they lose about a third of their body weight. Um, but these were just you know, absolutely fabulous to watch. The drama of it all um, was, was really uh, quite something. Uh, it was quite heartbreaking at times. Not all births were uh, ended well. Um, some of the youngsters were, were born very weak. Um, and indeed, some of them were even crushed by the males um, when they're looking to chase off rival males. But nothing is wasted in this environment. Uh, so what we can see here is some giant petrels coming in to feed on a small uh, elephant seal pup um, carcass. But what I really liked about this is just the, the body kind of body language, I guess, of, of, of these uh, petrels. It's almost prehistoric in appearance. Uh, the, the, the form that they're taking there looks, you know, it's almost like a dinosaur, really. Uh, and to see them chasing each other off uh, was really quite something. Now, you're probably going to be pleased to know that I'm not going to talk about every single landing because uh, we'd be here all night. So what I'm going to do is, is really just talk about a few of the key locations that we visited over the next five days. But what I have set out is just the landings that we made. So uh, what we've got on the left here is Right Whale Bay. That was on the first afternoon. The following day, we had the full day on Salisbury Plain. And then we went to Fortuna Bay uh, for a morning before going on to Gripfiken for the afternoon. We then had a full day in St Andrews Bay uh, before concluding uh, with a morning on Gold Harbour and then beginning our journey back to the Falklands. Now, we were incredibly lucky, guys. I have to stress that we were able to make all of our landings, but it doesn't always happen like that. The, the weather out here, the seas, they're very unpredictable. Uh, this is a, a very, very, um, you know, remote area and, and wild area. Um, so if you travel on this trip, you do have to be prepared for a bit of flexibility in the program. But the guys will work so hard to make the landings possible where they can. Now, you'll see here that all of the landings are on the northern side of uh, South Georgia. And that's because it's in the lee of the prevailing winds which come up from the south. And there's a degree of protection here because you've got the Allardyce mountain range that runs down the spine of the island and also the Spelsman uh, range just at the end here. The island itself is about 100, meter, 100 miles sorry, in length uh, and varies between two and about 24 miles in width. Now, 
this is what greeted us the following morning on Salisbury Plain. Uh, Salisbury Plain is widely regarded as being the largest area of, of flat land on South Georgia and consequently attracts huge numbers of king penguins, um, over 60,000 pairs at its peak. And first thing in the morning, they were coming down uh, to the shoreline either to bathe or to head off for a day's fishing. And uh, this is just a bit of footage that was captured on that first morning. number of penguins was just mind-blowing and what I loved the most is when they took to the water in these rafts they behaved um, a bit like birds in flight in terms of how uh, a flock might move together in unison like for example starlings uh, a memoration of starlings how they all move together these guys would do the same in the water swimming they will dive together they'd all turn left together all turn right it was just absolutely fabulous watching them this raft alone is probably getting on for a thousand birds in there. Uh, a lot of them are submerged at the moment, but uh, it was just so dramatic on this first morning. Uh, this just gives you a sense of the experience. And what you can see in the background there is some elephant seals as well. There was a huge number of elephant seals on Salisbury Plain. In the interior, that's where all the chicks were located. Uh, and there was tens of thousands of chicks. Um, these guys have a, a fascinating uh, life cycle or breeding cycle, shall we say. They only produce chicks every three years. And what happens is the adults uh, will typically lay an egg uh, in late November, something like that, into December. Uh, that will hatch after 50 days. So it's quite a long incubation period. And then the adults will feed it religiously every day uh, and, and fatten it up. Uh, through till around May time. The adults will rotate this responsibility uh, every three to seven days. They'll um, swap around uh, with the other one going off to feed and bringing back food. And then by about May time, all of the, uh, or a lot of the prey, uh, which these birds are reliant on in the area, the krill, the lanternfish, the squid, the prey density decreases enormously. And the king penguins essentially stop feeding the chicks and they'll stop feeding them for about three, four months on end. It won't be until September that the king penguins will start feeding them again when the prey density increases. So they have to survive the winter, uh, which I can't even imagine what it's like out here, entirely on their own and just purely off their own fat reserves. So naturally, uh, the mortality rate is very high and it can be up to 50%. Now, I hear you ask, like, why on earth would you do this? Now, the logic behind it, the reason this has evolved is because um, by surviving the winter like this and then um, having the adults return in September to begin feeding again, by September, October, November time, the chicks are turning into adults. They're getting their adult plumage, their adult feathers, and they're able to take to the sea at a time when the prey density is at a really good number and really high. And so they have a great well, much higher chance of success and, and of surviving um, by taking to the seas at this time. This is in contrast to the smaller penguins, which we find either on South Georgia or in the Falklands, where they rear chick just through the summer breeding season, just all in one go. So between September, October, and by April, they all leave the colony. Here it's extended over a year and a half. Now they are just magical little creatures, uh, incredibly endearing, uh, very cute. I hate using the word cute, but they are. There's, there's no other word for it. And the adults are just so spectacular in their plumage as well. And just seeing them alongside the uh, the chicks was was absolutely amazing to see the interaction between them. This is a, a little bit of footage again that I got just on my phone, um, just to give you a sense of what it's like. The chicks have got that really high pitched call, whereas there we go, thank you. Excuse me, whereas the, the adults, they sound a bit like a, I always think it sounds like a drone uh, in flight, kind of whirring, it's that kind of sound. You just hear it in the background there. 
I mentioned earlier that there was a few elephant seals on here. Um, there was a huge number of elephant seals, must have been several thousand. Um, and it was brilliant just being able to watch these uh, enormous animals uh, at close quarters again. Um, this is a, a big male, uh, so over five metres, over four tonnes. And he was a beach master. This is what you're labelled as once you've got your harem um, and you're able to, to dominate the beach. And when he feels threatened by another male, it, this is the response. So what we have here is actually the female on the left. The male has already done a runner. He's running for the hills over there. He's not hanging around to challenge this male. But this male, this beach master, then herds the female back into the center of his territory. He physically pushed her back over the next half an hour or so. This is just another clip. Um, these aren't beach masters. These are more kind of adolescent males just testing their strength against each other. But again, it gives you a a sense of the experience. There we go. Just a couple more shots of the elephant seals. They are just fabulous animals. Um, on the right here, we've got a couple of beach masters going at it. You can see all the scarring just down their, their necks and, and their upper torso there. Uh, it just speaks volumes of the, the fights that they've had over the years. Another species we encountered on Salisbury Plain were the fur seals. Now these guys, <laughs> they look incredibly cute, um, but looks can be deceiving. Um, they are actually some of the most feisty species I've ever come across. They are, they're not sleeping, they're fighting basically, sparring with each other. We'll see some footage in a bit where two are fighting away. In the early part of the season, which October is, they're in relatively low numbers, uh, which is actually a positive thing. Later in the year, densities can get really high and being so feisty, they can be aggressive towards visitors. So it can make it a little bit problematic trying to navigate around them. So the lower densities in October is actually a positive thing. Uh, and it's a remarkable species. They were nearly hunted to extinction about 200 years ago. Um, it's believed that the population, well, over 1.2 million pelts were taken by sealers back then, uh, but they have recovered to really good numbers these days. And if you were to travel later in the year, you would see thousands of these animals. A couple of other species we saw that day, this is a delightful little South Georgia pintail. Uh, it's a common duck species just on the little pools that are found inland and obviously also Antarctic terns. They were constantly patrolling the shallows, just diving down and snatching fish. Now we had the full day on Salisbury Plain and the next day uh, after a morning uh, landing we went on to Gripviken in the afternoon and Gripviken is a former whaling settlement and I have to admit it was it was quite a a sombre experience. Uh, it's it's got a, a very dark past, you know, that there's no ways, you know, no two ways around it really. And um, it, it's quite heartbreaking to, to read uh, about some of the stuff which took place here, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, when whaling was prolific, uh, when the sealers were here. Um, but it's all, I guess, it's a part of the history of this place. And what I love most is that the, the wildlife was gradually claiming Gripfican back but um, yeah, here we've got like an advanced party of king penguins and, uh, and, a, and a lone elephant seal here. But all of the machinery uh, from those whaling days had been left in place. All the vats where the, the oil from the, the whales were, was, was stored uh, are all still there. Um, it's also the resting place of Sir Ernest Shackleton, um, obviously that very famous uh, polar explorer. 
and there's a lot of detail uh, in Rick Vicken about his exploits over the years. I won't go into detail now, but that's a fascinating story. Um, and also there's the, the Whalers Church here. That was really interesting just to take a visit and, and look in there, uh, read some of the inscriptions and stuff. Uh, there's a museum here and also, uh, believe it or not, a post office and uh, a small gift shop. Now this is Danny, uh, my other half, just uh, having her photo taken with a wandering albatross which was in the museum. The museum uh, not only has details about the whaling history and, and Sir Ernest Shackleton but also has a lot of taxidermy, uh, so a lot of specimens uh, which you can see and this was, was really quite cool just being able to stand alongside a wandering albatross and fully appreciate the scale of this magical bird. This final photo of Gritviken uh, kind of sums the place up for me. It's, it's quite gloomy and quite atmospheric, um, but uh, definitely an important part of a visit to South Georgia. And I think most itineraries uh, when visiting South Georgia will include Gritviken. Now after Gritviken, we continued east and the following day we went to St Andrews Bay and had the full day on St Andrews Bay. And this was uh, for me, the best day of the trip um, for so many different reasons. I mean, firstly, uh, it is absolutely crammed full of wildlife, as we'll see in a few moments. We also had the most variable weather imaginable. Uh, when we first landed, as you can see here, there was a blizzard, um, which, although perishing and incredibly windy, uh, it was quite cool to experience that and just to see how the, the wildlife cope with that. This is just kind of gives you a sense of that experience on that first morning, um, just a wind whipping through. These are a couple of the first seals that I was talking about, just constantly sparring, fighting away. Now that kind of gives you a sense of what it was like first thing. About an hour later, the uh, snow shower had moved away and the sun came out and it just lit the place up. And this is when you could really get a sense of just what was going on here. It's only a three kilometer stretch of beach, but it can have over 6,000 elephant seals present uh, in the peak season. Um, King penguin wise, um, there's over 150 breeding pairs, I'm sorry, 150,000 breeding pairs of king penguin present here. And when you add on all the chicks and stuff at its peak, you know, that's pushing up towards half a million. It was absolutely crammed full of wildlife along the beach here. Um, this is just a bit of video uh, just to give you a sense of, of what it was like. This is, uh, this is a photo taken a little bit later in the day um, when a bit of space had cleared. Uh, a lot of the king penguins had moved out to go fishing for the day. So there's a bit more space around us, but it was just so much life here. Uh, I just couldn't believe it. And with that backdrop of the mountain range behind there, uh, I have to admit this, this is probably my best wildlife experience of all time. Um, I thought I'd had that a couple of days prior in Salisbury Plain, but this just blew it out of the water. It was absolutely amazing. When that sun came out, it just lit everything up. Uh, again, some fantastic opportunities just to see the elephant seals, see the king penguins, and just the huge numbers of, of birds that were present here. There was still quite a bit of snow around, so just getting those photos of the birds on the snow, uh, it was really atmospheric. And these are just a few of the photos that were taken over the course of that day. I really love this one. Uh, this is this is beautiful, just of the feet. Um, as I'm sure you guys will know, the birds don't build nests at all. They incubate the eggs uh, on top of their feet. They tuck them under a fold of skin uh, and keep them off, off, the, uh, off the cold uh, you know, surface of the rocks or the beach or whatever. And they also have this really endearing habit of just tucking their bill under their wings when they're sleeping. Uh, I, I struggle to think of a more beautiful bird than a king penguin. They are just magical. Having like 
spent all the time down on the beach just seeing all the activity down there we did head into the interior and up to a, a raised hill uh, which overlooked this this big plain below you've got the the beach at the back there and then this little valley that was just filled with penguins both the, the chicks and the adults and again just such spectacular scenery um this is really bad but i described it to Danny as, as being something like out of Lord of the Rings or, um, you know, Game of Thrones, just the scale of the place um, and the huge numbers of penguins and elephant seals that were present. Now, we spent the whole day on Gold Harbour, nipping back to the vessel to use the facilities to grab a bite to eat and then coming back ashore again. And uh, it was absolutely magical. And the following day, um, we went round to Gold Harbour uh, where we had the morning um, and then we received reports of some inclement weather coming in. So the decision was made to return back to the Falklands, but not before calling in at Dragowski um, Ford, which is about 14 kilometer Ford, where there's a huge glacier at the end. And this glacier rises up over 2000 meters. So it's really quite impressive. And uh, we, we took a, a journey up here before continuing on our way back to the Falklands. And then that journey back again, it took two and a half, three days, but there was plenty of opportunity to photograph the birds. This time traveling along the southern coast of uh, South Georgia, it was able to take photos with a, a really impressive kind of backdrop with the mountains behind. This is a gray headed albatross that was just seen as we motored past South Georgia. This is a, an imperial shag. And then just out at sea, uh, you had a, a wide variety of the petrels, the albatrosses all over again. The journey back was a little bit rougher than the journey over, but nothing you know that anybody really struggled with too much. Uh, certainly if you've got the appropriate medication, that, that really helps. And we spent a lot of time just out on deck scanning for the birds. We also saw our first icebergs of the trip. Uh, these had drifted up from Antarctica. Um, these were the first icebergs I've ever seen, in fact. So um, that was quite cool to see. Now, after two and a half days of traveling back to the Falklands, we arrived at Bleaker Island, which is just down in the south of the Falklands. And we had a morning ashore here, um, catching back up with some Gen 2 penguins. And my favorite, the, the rock hoppers again. Um, and there was a large colony of rock hoppers that were nest building at this time. Uh, and we spent a good couple of hours just watching them go about their antics. Uh, they're very grumpy little birds, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, fiercely territorial. They have their patch and they defend it with their lives, uh, but very photogenic again. This is a little clip which I took. Um, just shows you just how feisty these little characters are. What, what I don't understand is why he didn't just come around this side and, and avoid but uh, for some reason he wanted that path and he lost a few feathers as a result. There was also a colony of imperial shags here. I mean, that's just a stunning bird in its own right. Uh, and there were several thousand imperial shags present. Now, after the morning on Bleaker, it was sadly time to wrap up the, the wildlife side of things and to return to Stanley. So this is just coming back into Stanley that afternoon where we anchored just offshore uh, ahead of the uh, return journey back to the UK the following morning. And it was a flight um, from Mount Pleasant back to Punta Arenas and then up to Santiago. Uh, the flight didn't leave till the early afternoon, but we had to disembark first thing. So it was quite a long day of travel. Uh, we got back to Santiago in the evening, uh, had a night there and then flew back to the UK the following day. Now, I'm sure I've probably talked for long enough now, but before I wrap up, I'll just give you a few tips and forgive me uh, if you know all of this stuff already, but this is stuff which I felt um, I could have done with knowing before I went on the trip. So first of all, just to say that the muck boots are provided out there. They work very well. Uh, everybody's given a pair of muck boots and you provide your size in advance of travel, but they don't provide waterproof jackets or trousers. So you need to take your own um, and make sure they're decent quality because they will be tested. Certainly on the Zodiac trips when you're going ashore and stuff, there's always spray uh, and uh, you'll get wet. So you want a good pair of waterproofs there. Minimize Velcro, this is a top tip. Um, from a biosecurity perspective, we have to check all of the waterproofs, all of the clothing, all of the bags uh, that are going ashore. Check them for any seeds, any organic material. 
and Velcro, as I've found out, is a nightmare for retaining this material. So the less Velcro you can have on these items, the better. Good sunglasses, sunscreen, you are exposed to the sun out there. There's, there's little atmosphere and, and it can burn uh, if you're not careful. Uh, a dry bag, whether you're a photographer or not, uh, it's pretty essential in my opinion. You want a proper dry bag for taking um, you know, your belongings ashore, whether that's your binoculars, whether that's spare clothing or whatever. Uh, a good dry bag is definitely a good move. If you're into photography or videography, a sturdy try or monopod, uh, essential, as you saw, uh, there's some strong winds out there that whip across the beach. And if you haven't got something solid, that will go flying. Uh, motion sickness patches, uh, scopoderm, I think that's how you pronounce it. That was very good for us. They're little patches that we were able to apply just behind the ear and they'd last for two or three days and then you change them again. And um, certainly on the journey back when it was a little bit more lumpy, they made a big difference. Uh, important to note that there is laundry available um, on the vessel, so you don't need to overpack. Um, and also, just for loved ones and stuff, if you're heading out there, the Wi-Fi on the vessel is very, very limited. It's very patchy. Your allocator is a small amount of memory, um, but that's used up very quickly. And then for the most part, uh, across the, the voyage, and it was a 14-night voyage, we didn't really have much Wi-Fi at all or any network. So, um, yeah, just forewarn your loved ones. Now, as I've said at the start, we are returning back in October 2025 as a Festival of Wildlife, and we've already got a fantastic team lined up. We've got Mark Carradine, uh, we've got Chris uh, joining us, we've got Nick Magman, Nick Garvett, and Jonathan Truss. So in addition to the uh, talks that we'll be having on board by the expedition team, we'll also be running a series of workshops, and whether that's photography focused, whether that's sculpting, or even you know um, painting and sketching uh, with Jonathan. Uh, so it should be an absolutely magical trip. We've got exclusive use of the vessel and she is absolutely superb, I promise you. So um, I'm very excited about that in 2025. And if that wasn't enough for you, we are also offering some extensions. Uh, specifically, we're doing a group extension to Torres del Paine National Park uh, in search of these guys. They are, of course, pumas, and this has to be one of the best big cat um, experiences out there. You're able to track the pumas on foot and view and photograph them on foot. It's uh, a wonderful thing to do. If that's not your cup of tea, uh, we can also arrange extensions to Easter Island or even the Atacama Desert. Now, there's those details again. And um, yeah, hopefully. Mr. Breen is, is waiting in the wings for us. Um, Chris. My goodness, Dan, that was absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. Christ. <laughs> Thank you. Can't Thank believe you. it. Well, I can't believe it. I know what you like and I know how much you enjoyed the trip and I know how incredible that place is. Isn't it just one of the best places on earth? It's, it's mind-blowing, Chris. It, it's the, the combination of the the quantity but in the in the landscape as well that the combination of the two the setting and and, and just the sheer volume um it, it blew me away it, i think the only thing that compares with it is, is perhaps the migration for example in africa you know the wildebeest migration yeah. out there where you've got that volume of animals but yeah. even then it's not in a setting like that is it let's face it oh my goodness it's just incredible and that um and, and I and I uh, the imagery, of course, has been spectacular, uh, no doubt about it. And the video, absolutely stunning. And there's there, there is something really amazing about the yellows and blacks and oranges on the king penguins combined with the white and the, and the white behind the king penguins. And you can kind of blow everything else out. And you've just got this amazing orange and black and gray and yellow. It's stunning. It's the most amazing. It is one of the most. Paul has just put a message up, and I agree with you, Paul. It is one, well, one of the most incredible places on earth. It's mm. just spectacular. Oh my goodness! It, it's it's so special. It, it really is. Um, yeah, very very fortunate to have been out there, and very fortunate to be returning in in 2025. Yeah, I have to say, I'm very, I'm, I'm even more excited about it now than I was before. Um, so look, we've got a few questions, and and first things first, before I before I um throw a couple of questions in your direction, I'm just going to um um uh, sort of uh, warn everybody. No, I'm not. It's too late. I've done it. I've clicked on the thing which um which asks them a question and whether they would like to leave, uh, whether they would like to um, receive a little bit more information about our festival of wildlife. Uh, departing in 2025 and why wouldn't they after such an amazing talk as that um hey dan so look a couple of questions well no uh, before a couple of questions i've got to say don't you think that dolphin gulls are just the most beautiful gull on earth <laughs> they are, yes, they are. They? 
Yeah, totally bonkers. Gull- I, I love them. Gulls get a bad rap, but you, you can't fault a, a dolphin gull. It's no, so you striking. Can't fault yeah. gull. No, no, no. I, I absolutely agree. They are great. Hey, look, um, I need to ask you a couple of questions, otherwise everybody will be bored with my rabbiting. Um, so, look, uh, the trip and a trip in 2025, which I know we are both looking forward to enormously, aboard um, what is undoubtedly at present the best vessel on the oceans uh, for this type of trip. There's no doubt about it. But it's very early in the season, right? Um, yes. We're going um, on, you know, in early early October, 11th of October. Um, why are we going so early? Why is it so amazing? Is it a bit too early, do you think, or what? No, absolutely not. I mean, I should add, the, the trip that I was on here, that was, we were, that was the first two weeks in October. So this is, uh, you know, a week or two later when we're running the festival. But for yeah. me, that is the optimum time. You've got this wonderful, you'll still have this wonderful snowy landscape. You've got all the wildlife, you know, is returning in droves. There'll be even more penguins when we visit than, than what I experienced. But even what I experienced was was mind blowing. You know, there's tens of thousands. Um, and you also have the advantage of not having too many fur seals. I know it sounds a bit excessive, but they can be problematic later in the season, yeah. can't they? I'm sure you've experienced yeah. it, Chris, but yeah. they arrive in such high numbers um, and they, they, they are aggressive uh, towards visitors. So. That is also, um, you know, a, a bit of a perk, really. Um, I would also say that the first part of the the year as well, a lot of the other vessels and the other operators, they tend to visit in November, December, which is, you know, still a, a wonderful time to visit. You know, there's no doubt about it. But I would imagine that there's going to be less traffic around as well in that early part of the year. Um, certainly, when we were out there, we didn't see another vessel at that time, which was which was quite cool. Yeah, 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 I agree. And in actual fact, I mean, I think it is worth saying that um, the uh, the the organisation between the vessels is exceptional. So it's actually unusual to see other vessels, I, I, I think. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think there'll be far fewer vessels there mm-hmm. at this time of year than even two or three weeks later. But it's it's un, it's unusual to see other vessels. In, in, in some respects, it... it um, you know, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a treat when you do in a way. I think, well, right, that's amazing. Look, there's another vessel. There's someone else here. It feels a yeah. bit unusual. But there is also another important point where we're going in October, and that's around the elephant seals. Um, yeah. So the female elephant seals give birth uh, in October, as we saw there. They were pupping the whole time, and they actually are receptive to mating about a week later. It's only eight days later, and um, obviously when they're receptive to mating, that gets the boys going and, and that can instigate a little bit of fighting and stuff potentially between them. That's when things really heat up with regard to the males sparring with each other. So that's another reason why we're going in that early part of the year. If you were to go later in the year, uh, a few months later, or even a couple months later, those big boys, those, those big males will have moved off and it will just be the females that are left on the beach. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I'm going to think, I think the... Um... The, uh, the the take home message there is that there is an awful lot happening at that time in October. It's mad yes. busy, basically, with all sorts of interesting and exciting wildlife activity. Yeah, it's a good summary. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so, what about zodiacs on board? So, one of the things that I particularly love about um, about the vessel that we're going on is that the zodiac deck is. Um, a, a sort of pretty it's a, it's the sea level deck isn't it you're almost at sea level so for those many people that there are still on 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 our presentation this evening will have, who will have been on other vessels um where in order to board the zodiacs you're climbing down a series of um a series of steps it's all generally speaking very safe and well organized and so on and so forth but on um, Magellanic Explorer, you don't have to do that, do you? You literally you walk straight out of the Zodiac deck, uh, deck and straight onto the Zodiacs. Yeah. So you haven't got it's, that slightly uncomfortable situation of walking down or up when you're getting back on. Yeah, no, it's extremely well done. And, and the guys are so obviously safety conscious. If there's too much swell, they just pull it and you just wait until it subsides or they reposition to, you know, to get themselves in the lee of the land or something like that, where it's a bit calmer. And then you go again. But um, no, it was it was effortless. It was it was really very good. Um, you've always got at least two members of the crew, you know, assisting you. They'll you didn't see it in the video, but 
they will insist on taking your bag off and putting that across yeah. first because that's one of the biggest dangers if you're trying to go across with your bag on you can you know lose your balance and, and topple over but um no it was um it was very well done and in terms of zodiacs um on board and people on board plenty of zodiacs for all the passengers so no one's got to wait behind no it, the, the um disembarkation was 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 faultless you know um everybody with only 90 packs everybody can go ashore um for as long as they want to really and uh you know the longest we had to wait for for going ashore maybe 10 15 minutes something like that um but what you tend to find is on the first couple of days everybody's like an eager beaver and down there you know ready to go at first light and then the, the kind of people kind of chill out a little bit and, and and um kind of they're not down there at first light and you kind of filter through and it just works really well and what i was really impressed with is the fact that they will just take you back to the vessel whenever you want through the day i thought it was going to be more regimented than that i thought it was going to be like right you're going ashore for three hours and then you, you're not coming back again until those three hours are up but like i say whenever you wanted to go back just for a loo break or coffee or you know bite to eat you could do that so um yeah fabulous and and I have to say one of the other particularly nice things about Magellanic Explorer, depending on uh, depending on what where you are on the ship, um, whether you're in the library, for example, or in um, one of the lecture rooms, uh, and depending on the cabin types you have, there are lots of floor to ceiling windows, um, and some of the cabins, of course, have verandas. Um, so you're you you're you're only ever a very short visual distance away from potentially something incredible happening in the ocean so you haven't got to you know if somebody if there was a call that for example there are humpback whales nearby or whatever it might be um you haven't got to spend ages and ages and ages um disappearing off to find your way down to the front of the ship or the top of the ship to get out and have a look there's lots of nearby places um where there are good viewing opportunities yeah Absolutely. And I didn't include it in the presentation, so you'll have to forgive me, but we did see some cetaceans. Orcas were seen, um, humpback whales were seen distantly. Um, we had quite a few sightings of Peel's dolphin and obviously the, the Commerson's dolphin on Falklands. Yeah. So there were some cetaceans around, but we had some yeah, choppier seas, so it was a little bit difficult to see stuff at times. Um, I'm sure if we had slightly flatter seas, calmer seas, we would have seen some more. And 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 um, I guess just a, a couple of other final questions. Um, I, I'm going to ask you this question, but I know that many of the photographs were taken by Danny. But um, there are one or two questions about photography and cameras and lenses. Do you want to comment on that, or do you want me to comment on that? Well, Danny, um, she had a 100 to 400, and then she also had a 300 prime, and she th those are the two lenses that she used the whole time. Um, I had an iPhone, um, and I. <laughs> a little that video camera <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately like the video i had to shrink it quite a bit to make it compatible for this evening's talk otherwise it just wouldn't have downloaded you know and streamed fast enough but um yeah it was it was nice getting a a bit of the boat you know a bit of both video and and still um oh it's I, great I, yeah brilliant i don't know if you've I, obviously on the landscape side of things you, you probably want to a landscape lens uh you know wide angle uh, lens would be advantageous because some of the settings are so spectacular but in all honesty this is not my forte uh this is why we've got yourself this is why we've got uh, mark this is why we've got nick garvett you know on board so um if there are specific questions relating to that then we can obviously fire that off to them okay yeah absolutely um so then um a couple of final things um doug has asked about the species of skewer that you might see on the trip and i know you well you and i both had some a, a number of different species but you might be you'll, you'll be more up to speed on that than i am it's brown skewer was the species of skewer which was most prolific um and that's what we were seeing uh on south georgia and that was what was darting in you know to to consume the afterbirth and stuff when the pups were being born um so they were ever present uh but it was it was brown skewer cool okay and then um uh one or two questions about temperature um and sort of likely temperatures and i, I i'm going to preempt your answer very slightly um ju just by saying that to some extent um provided you're prepared for the climate the temperature is not terribly relevant but i, I don't want to put words in your mouth 
No, absolutely. Um, temperatures were typically between five degrees, well, minus five and about plus five. Um, and then obviously, if you had the wind whipping across, you had a, a colder wind chill factor. But I, I, in all honesty, I don't have any specialist polar gear necessarily. I had some thermals and then I'd have an outer layer and then my waterproofs, and that was perfectly adequate. Um, but if you are feeling cold, like I say, you go back to the vessel, you heat up, you warm up, and then you go back again. Um, but yes. we, we, we didn't have any issues there. No, cool. Um, and then I, I might just answer this final one myself. Um, Helen has asked about whether there's an open bridge policy. And I think in principle, there always has been an open bridge policy. I think there's been a bit of a, bit of a hiccup um, over the course of the last two or three years on account of, um, what was it called? Oh, yeah, COVID. Um, yeah, that was it. <laughs> so yeah uh so uh, yeah i mean with any luck helen we'll, we'll we'll be back to an open bridge policy again uh well uh certainly by the time we get to 2025 unless there are other conditions that um the, that, that prevent that but i think that's a, a perfectly reasonable assumption absolutely um, it, it would normally be open bridge uh but yeah because of covid it, it wasn't they didn't want to take the risk no, 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 indeed. Absolutely. And, and that was the same, of course, on all of the vessels. Um, well, before we disappear, you need to tell me what your favourite wildlife encounter was of all of them. It's the leopard seal. Um, and it's it's gruesome, but the leopard seal catching the penguin and then thrashing it around and flaying it. And if anybody's really interested, I'll quite happily share the footage. But when I showed it to the team, they were just like, Dan, you, you can't put that on a presentation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't. Um but uh, I really wanted to see the leopard seals. They're, they're just magnificent. They've got that reptilian head, three metres long, and, and they're, they are ferocious, you know, um, certainly if you're a penguin anyway. Uh, so that, that, was, that was my standard. But I think that just that aside, the, the scale of the, the sighting and, and probably St Andrew's Bay, just that setting with all of the penguins, all of those elephant seals, that, that's something that's going to stay with me, you know, forever, really, I think. Um, that those two things probably so i'm not paul daniels but i wrote down two things on my piece of paper that i thought were your favorites one was leopard seal and the other was saint andrew's bay <laughs> <laughs> well you're obviously paying attention during the talk yeah. which is good it obviously absolutely. came across um hey dan thank you so much that was absolutely brilliant um and thank pleasure. you everybody for spending your evening with us we really appreciate it um and uh, I hope you've had a super evening. I'm sure you have. Um, and we'd love to see you on board Magellan Explorer in um, October 2025. Um, so do please give us a call. If you want to chat to Dan, you're very, very welcome. If you want to chat to me, you're very welcome or, or any of our team. Um, but thank you very much for spending the evening with us. Dan, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Cheers.